Welcome to the Wealth Matters Podcast, where investors come together to better understand how to build passive cash flow and create generational wealth without all the confusing mumbo jumbo. Here's your host and co author of Amazon number one bestseller, Alpesh Pamar. Welcome to Wealth Matters Podcast. I am going to talk to Mr. Jordan Barry. He's of course based out of California, like me as well. He was a pastor for 15 years and transitioned out of full-time ministry into buying a laundromat. Who would have thought that moving Naturally. from ministry to laundromat? But I I love talking about new businesses, especially real estate and depreciation. So his experience buying his first laundromat was not a good one. And and it happens with a lot of, uh, lot of us, right? And most of the people then give up. But he did not give up. Instead of replacing his salary as he expected, his laundromat lost $2,000 per month for well over a year. Desperate to find help to turn his business around, he frantically searched for someone to guide him to profitability. He found no rescue, so he decided to share hard-earned lessons he learned on a blog and YouTube channel uh, like me and Somehow, uh, after you know, going through and uh, talking to a lot of laundromat owners, he is a successful laundromat owner himself as well. So, welcome, Jordan. Oh, thank you, uh, Alpesh. Uh, it's an honor to be here, and uh, really excited to talk with you about laundromats of all things. <laughs> oh, absolutely, and I they are here to stay. So I, I love this. <laughs> yeah, they're definitely here to stay. So we start with this question with every guest. Tell us something interesting or funny about yourself, even though I already spilled the beans about ministry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it is funny. You know, I didn't, uh, when I was a, a kid, I wasn't sitting around dreaming under the tree on a summer day of owning laundromats. You know, I wasn't, it right. was not the goal. Um, in fact, I studied, you know, here's what's kind of funny is that I studied physics in college ended up in ministry wow. and now own laundromats and podcasting and YouTubing and stuff. So it's just a weird, you know, sometimes you like get to that point in life and you just sort of like look around and you're like, how did I get here? <laughs> None so of those weird. are rela related, right? <laughs> yeah, nothing related whatsoever. Uh, so it's just a funny, uh, funny little life path that I'm on right now. <laughs> that's good. So let's talk about investment because in this show we focus on alternative investments and yep. that is why real estate is the you know biggest uh, part of our portfolio here. What was your first investment and how did it work out for you? Yeah, so so when I was in in ministry like I I mean I had some like retirement account stuff but I really wasn't I didn't know anything about investing. I didn't know anything about stock market. I didn't know anything about real estate. I didn't know anything about businesses and you nothing about anything. Uh, so my, really my first investment was buying my first laundromat. Um, and you know, maybe it explains a lot on why it didn't go so well that I knew essentially nothing, um, there. So I, I ended up buying this laundromat, the concept behind, we had a family friend who, you know, worked up in the Bay Area at a at a tech job there, was working 70, 80 hours a week, ended up buying a laundromat and replacing his income uh, from his tech job with the laundromat and was working five hours a week. And we heard that and we're like, my wife and I, and we're like, yeah, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, and so that's sort of how we ventured into laundromats. Uh, but again, I didn't really know what I was doing at the time. This was almost a decade ago now. And at the time there really wasn't any information out there hardly uh, on how to value a laundromat, what to look for, how to operate it properly. The information just wasn't out there. And so, uh, yeah, so it didn't, it didn't go well for me. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and this happens with almost all of us, right? We see someone else doing something really successfully and, and we run after that shiny object. And I keep doing this even after <laughs> investing for 15 years and being in real estate for almost 10 years, even though then I see something else and I'm, oh, I should do this as well, right? Because yeah. you you try to think about first, um, you want to replace your income, right? You you all also want, don't want to work far more than five, 10 hours a week, right? right. So you start looking at a lot of uh, things, but I'm glad that it worked out for you. So after 
been with laundromat industry for over a decade now. Why laundromats or other investments? Yeah. So here's here's what I love about laundromats. Uh, there's a few things, but uh, listen, if you're if your goal is to replace your nine to five income, if you're trying to achieve financial freedom, and you're trying to do that as quickly as possible, uh, so I, I'm a real estate investor. I have both commercial and residential real estate. And probably actually real estate is my first love when it comes to asset class. I love real estate. However, with that being said, the average real estate deal cannot touch the average laundromat deal when it comes to cash flow. I see. When we're talking replacing your nine to five income or financial freedom, we're talking cash flow. Yes. And that's and, very important. Yeah. And so I think for a lot of people, you know, I was all on the, you know, replace my income with real estate investing train for a little while until I started doing some of the math in my head. And I'm like, if I'm going to get like $200 a door, right. uh, I got to get a whole lot of doors in order to replace my modest pastor right. income. Right. Um, and, and for a laundromat, I mean, the reality is, is that 99% of America can replace their, you know, their W2 income with one to three laundromats. That's right. what you're, that's what you're looking at. And so, you know, when you're talking laundromats, you know, an average base hit laundromat deal, uh, you should net after all your expenses, you should net 20 to 25% uh, return on your money. And that's unleveraged. So if you apply a oh, loan wow. appropriately, wow. those numbers can go up significantly uh, from there. And so you can see how that cash flow can really snowball. If you pick up a couple of laundromats and you're getting 25, 30, 50% return on your money uh, from day one, you know, you can, you can replace that income pretty quickly. And and that's amazing, right? Because all of us know by, you know, after watching all this inflation horror stories, right? Mm -hmm. That money now is worth way more than money later, right? So a lot yeah. of time, and, and even in real estate, I only look for cash flow. But most of my friends, when they invest in real estate, they're like, oh, yeah, we are buying it for appreciation. We know in Bay Area or in LA and Texas, this property will double in five years. I'm like, yeah, in five years. And mm -hmm. that if you time the market right, right? But if you right. don't have cash flow to sustain that uh, property, even, then you are not going to survive, right? And it's very important to have that cash flow mindset. And if you can combine that cash flow with depreciation, and you don't have to pay any tax. And now, as you said, the snowball effect, take the cash flow from here, reinvest somewhere else if you don't need it, right? In another mm -hmm. laundromat. meadows. Then now you have income coming from two properties, three properties. Yeah, absolutely. And and that is the other, you know, if I was to kind of put put like real estate and laundromat side to side, if you take the cash flow side, you know, the cash flow on a laundromat is going to be significantly higher than than most uh, real estate deals. Uh, laundromat's gonna be higher than most real estate deals. When we're talking about tax depreciation, I'd give a slight edge right. to real estate, but I mean, having laundromats can be great. I mean, all those machines can be depreciated, yes. obviously running business expenses through it. Not a tax professional, but uh, there's a lot of great things you can do tax-wise with both real estate and laundromats. So they, they're both great for that. And then appreciation-wise, I think you're probably gonna get a, a better bang oh, for really your buck. Sick most of the time in real estate, but you also can build uh, equity in your laundromat too. Um, and I think you can supercharge your wealth by having both, right? Both, if, yes. you, if you benefit from the cash flow of something like a laundromat and you know the appreciation and then the combined tax benefit of both of them, you can supercharge your wealth uh, much quicker than I think I uh, most people are doing that. I agree. And that's where I was going, you know, take the cash flow from laundromat, invest in real estate and get, you know, pretty much right off at least this year, 80% of the investment. If you yep. bonus depreciate it or cost segregate it, right? Mm -hmm. Now, you know, you are not paying any tax on any of the cash flow because you are able to write it off in real estate. So yeah, if you combine both of them, that would be a great strategy. So let's talk about numbers because you mentioned 20, 25%. Can you throw us some numbers like from one of your deals well, what you are doing, how much you paid for it? Did you get a loan and how much you are making right now? Yeah, so, well, 
I mean, depends. Do you want to talk about a good deal or a bad deal? Uh, Bob, <laughs> we we we'll, get to the, we'll get to the bad deal later. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, uh, all right. So I, I ended up with a seller, uh, seller financed off market deal. A broker actually brought it to me. It was a pocket listing, but it was a seller finance deal um, with the laundromat and the real estate. So, I mean, this is like a great opportunity, like I said, to supercharge your wealth there. Um, so the way we broke it down, the, the seller wanted $750,000 this is in LA, wanted $750,000 total. So the way we ended up breaking it down um, for the actual acquisition was we did a 200 for the laundromat. And for that, I brought uh, 100,000 and then the seller financed 100,000. And then 550 for the property, and I brought 50 for the property, and the seller financed 500 uh, there. So, uh, you know, pretty cool. And, you know, one of the benefits to, like, I know in real estate, uh, it's sort of like the holy grail for like seller financing. Everybody's like, I want seller financing deal, yes. right? Um, well, one of the cool things, well, it's, it's sort of a double edged sword, actually, but one of the good things potentially about laundromats is that seller financing is actually fairly common. Um, uh, not always hundred percent seller financing, but some portion of seller financing is actually fairly common, um, which is awesome. Cause you can do a lot of, uh, you can get a little bit creative on nice. the seller financing stuff. Um, however, the reason for the availability of seller financing is that because laundromats, we tend to be notorious for either not having very good books or maybe hmm. no books yeah, or, having really good books. Like maybe we ah. might have more than one book, if you know what I mean. Right. <laughs> right. right? Of and course. so, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So that makes it difficult to finance them sometimes. Um, and so the sellers end up financing them for you a lot of times. So again, it's sort it can be a double-edged sword, but right. it can be a really good uh, perk. And it's um, a win-win a lot of time because the seller can don't have to pay tax on the entire amount. Yep. You know, even can continue to get some cash flow. Yeah, and as you absolutely. said, on the buyer side, you can be creative and, you know, maybe the seller wants a higher price, then we pay a little less in interest or vice versa, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So that was that deal. We, we I bought it for 200 and then the property for 550. Uh, I think the laundromat was probably priced about right. I think the there was meat on the bone with that real estate. Uh, so I think got a, got a fairly good deal on the real estate. Um, for that one, um, if I'm thinking, this was like seven, eight years ago. So I'm trying to think back to what, uh, the numbers were like when we took over. So, so I made some mistakes, um, on that right. deal too. Um, and, uh, it, it, so it didn't perform as well as I thought it was going to perform, uh, which I think I was projecting it to make 60 or 65 net a thousand a year. Um, and I want to say it came in more like 45,000. Oh, okay. Um, so we weren't horribly off, but it was definitely right. for our, the way we value in our industry, it was definitely, uh, overpriced, but I like see. I said, the real estate covers over a lot of mistakes. Uh, you right. Know, if, right. You, if you buy that correctly. Um, so, yeah, no, this, this is great. So let's talk about, cause you spoke about mistakes, right? So before then, yes. Uh -huh. If I have a deal in front of me, yeah, how do I value a laundromat correctly? Yeah, great question. So, uh, so any business, but a laundromat, no exception, right? Is going to be valued based on its net income, net operating income. I know I. Um, yeah, and so what we're looking at, just you know, so we're all on the same page. I'm sure you guys are all savvy out there, but just so we're all on the same page. Uh, you know, net income is essentially it's your income minus your expenses, right. but before like loan payments, taxes, yes. that kind of thing. Uh, so, so that's what we're looking at. And that's the cornerstone of the value of the laundromat. And then we apply a multiple to it. Um, so if you're familiar with like commercial real estate, you have like a capitalization cap rate, rate or cap yes. rate. Uh, a multiple is just the inverse of a right. cap rate. Um, so it has been traditionally in our industry, the, the average multiple has been somewhere between three and a half and five. Okay. But the last like 18 months or so, 12 to 18 months, I'm seeing that multiple shift up a little. So I'd call it more oh, up one, four yeah. to five and a half uh, right. right now. There's a lot of, there's a growing demand in laundromats right, right now with some of the like 
Cody Sanchez. And yes, she's, she's uh, selling it a lot. Joy. That's how yeah. I was watching. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so there's a growing interest in laundromats. Um, and there's, you know, some new technology finally coming into our industry that allows you to uh, manage them uh, a much easier. Remotely you can, and yeah. Yeah, easier, you can do yeah. it a little more remotely. You can manage more of them. Um, and uh, and also there's a limited supply right now. I mean, similar to real estate where there's more demand than supply right now. Um, and it's keeping prices up in sort of both segments uh, right now. So. So, so uh, you mentioned the equity multiple. Is there anything else you look at? Um, I mean, yes. So, well, so in order to sort of figure out where the multiple is, there's three basic numbers that you need to essentially get that multiple. You can factor in and sort of tweak it uh, from there. But, uh, but the three main numbers are you need to know the age of the equipment, right? The uh, one misconception is that the laundromat's value is based on how much the equipment's worth which is not true. It's based on the income. However, the, the equipment value does factor in and it factors in as one of the three main factors of the, of the multiple. Okay. So obviously, you know, new equipment's better. So higher multiple vice versa. Right. Uh, the second one is the rent amount, how much your rent is. Uh, and you know, one of one big question is, well, how do I know if it's a good rent or not? Right. And so uh, a benchmark sort of rule of thumb, I like to look at the rent as a percentage of the gross income, yes. the total income. And really what we're trying to hit is that 25% of the gross income or less. That's what okay, we're looking for. Max, yeah. Um, you know, give or take, if, if it's over that, it's not like a deal breaker necessarily, but once you get up around like 33, 35% wow, then, yeah. plus, it gets harder and harder to make a profit once that rent starts creeping up there. Right. Um, and then the third number is how many years are left on the lease. And for a laundromat, a long lease is better um, yes. because there's a lot of infrastructure and stuff. So if the landlord's right. like, hey, we're not going to renew your lease. Well, now you got a bunch of equipment and no business, right? Or if the landlord's right. like, hey, we're going to double your rent when your lease is up. Now your cash flow is going down. And then also remember... That net income is the cornerstone of the value of your laundromat. So you lost a bunch of cash flow every year, but you also lost a bunch of equity out of your business. So long right. lease is better, which means higher multiple there. Oh, that's great. And what would be the third number you look at? So age of the equipment, rent amount, and number of years on the lease. Number of years on the lease, yeah. right. So all, yeah. all those three. Yep. So that that's great. And um, another thing I always, because I was looking at laundromat, again, not to just invest, but more trying to figure out if this is for me or not. Mm -hmm. How does it work, just the managing? Is there an operational headache? And with especially all the issues we are seeing in blue states like ours, right? Mm -hmm. A lot of loots and vandalism. Is that affected? Uh, are laundromats affected if they are not in the right market or area? Yeah. So, I mean, laundromats can be a magnet for some of that stuff, right? Homeless exactly. people trying to sleep in them, <laughs> you know, like, and, and, and usually it's because it's an unattended laundromat. So there's nobody there during the day. Maybe somebody comes in and cleans for an hour or two, but the rest of the day, there's not really anybody there. So that's an unattended model. A lot of those headaches go away. Uh, for example, example, I have uh, one laundromat that's in uh, on the border of East LA. It's, it's a little bit of a rough neighborhood. It's unattended. Nobody's there all day. I just hire somebody to clean it. I have probably 25 times more headaches with that little laundromat than I have another laundromat that's in South Central LA, which you would think is like, it's definitely a rougher neighborhood right. uh, that it's in, but I have somebody there all day and I have very few headaches uh, uh, at that laundromat. So it depends a little bit on where you're at. Depends on your business model uh, that you have going there. Um, and, you know, if you've got somebody there or not. So a lot of those headaches go away if you've got somebody there. I see. But anytime, you know, just to kind of go real quick, anytime you have people or you have machines, there's going to be problems. Yes. Right? And laundromats have a lot of both. both. <laughs> so there are both. problems that come up to answer that question. This would, this business, gets pitched as a passive income. And I would not say it's passive. It's I'd say on the, all, yeah. on the scale of passivity to active, you can lean it pretty heavily on the passive side, but it's never going to be, no. you know, full no, throttle it's not passive. Realistic. Yeah. yeah. But, but it can be fairly passive. I see. 
So um, let me ask you about this because you mentioned about mistakes. What mistakes someone should avoid? <clears throat> yeah. Well, okay. So I'm, I mean, I'll share some of my mistakes that I made and some that I hear about a lot. I do a lot of, uh, you know, consulting now and, and stuff like that. So uh, I, I see a lot of things <laughs> and I've experienced <laughs> a lot of things. So, uh, you know, one, the biggest one for me and, you know, just, just to frame it up, when I got into this business, I was completely naive. I knew next to nothing about the business. So I relied on one of the two people who stood to gain for me buying a laundromat. It was the broker, right? The broker and the seller. I relied almost entirely on that broker um, to help me figure out what laundromat to get, to help me right. figure out how to value it, to help me to make sure it was performing the way it was supposed to. And it just turned out that the broker that I worked with did not have my best interest of in mind. Of course, <laughs> most of the time. Yeah. So, I mean, one huge lesson for me was like, you know, and I, I've, I've said this before, but like, uh, if I, if, if me back then could have 15 minutes with me now, it would have saved me six figures and a whole lot of heartache and headache, uh, early on. Right. And, you know, for me now, it's like any asset class that you want to get into just number one, we can get this analysis paralysis, right. You've got to take the action step, but I'd say the biggest thing, you know, do a research, but put some time around it. Uh, but the biggest thing that you can do is find somebody who's already doing the thing that you're trying to do, whether that's laundromats or commercial real estate or residential real estate or short-term rentals or what, you know, whatever the asset class is, just find somebody and, and enlist their help, whether you hire them or they're a friend or you trade like, you know, services for their advice or whatever, like have somebody who's already successful in that helping you navigate uh, that. And I'd say that's especially true in a business like a laundromat, which is still by and large a cash business, which means it can be very difficult to verify income and expenses and therefore value uh, the laundromat. There's a lot of potential gotchas uh, in this business in particular. No, that, that makes sense. So let's talk about your best deal so far. Yeah. Uh, so, well, I, I think, I think one that's in the works is going to be the best deal and I can't share that one yet. So I'll, you know, probably that one where I bought the real estate uh, with it is ended up being the best deal, even though it initially didn't end up being uh, the cash flow that I was looking for. Um, so what had happened was we had made an offer. We did all our due diligence, but there was a, there was a divorce kind of pending. Uh, so see. our escrow period like lengthened out to like six months and I did wow. all the due diligence on the front end. I didn't redo the due diligence on the back end. And what happened was like a half a mile away, somebody had built a brand new, bigger yeah. laundromat down the road. Right. And it, it opened the day I took over. Uh, so day one, our income was, was down. Right. So right. even though that was a little bit of a punch in the gut, uh, that one probably was still the biggest, uh, the best deal because one thing that's interesting, you know, commercial real estate also is valued on your, your net income yes. and you apply a cap rate to it. But when you own a business in the actual commercial real estate too, you have some ability to force some equity just by moving cash from your business yeah, to, to, rent, yeah. <laughs> yeah, to your, to your real estate. And so, you know, we're able to almost, uh, well, more actually more than double the value of that property just by, setting up an appropriate triple net lease between the laundromat and, and that property. Um, so, I mean, I'd say that that ended up, even though it didn't start out very well, I think that ended up being one of our better deals for sure. No, oh, that that's awesome. Hey, so uh, let me ask you about this because in this deal, you ended up buying real estate. So was it a small shopping center or it was just one uh, laundromat standing there? Yeah, it was just a two unit. It was one, it was the laundromat and then one small uh, retail space uh, next to it. Yeah. So uh, now you, and you mentioned about someone built in now uh, brand, brand new laundromat right there. And you are talking about demand. If there is a lot of demand and there are people building left and right. And I know there are a couple of companies, they are also selling their franchise for laundromat. 
do you think the demand would stay there because that supply may outstrip the demand at some point uh i don't i don't well not anytime in the near future i don't think i think you know a lot of places it's really difficult and expensive and uh almost cost prohibitive to build uh for an example i was looking to build a build out a 3000 square foot space it was in a shopping center we didn't own the shopping center we we're just going to lease out the space 3000 square feet um and there's something called an impact fee and an impact fee is Listen, there's a lot of ridiculous government yes. fees out there that we encounter. An impact fee has got to be one of the most ridiculous, if not the yes. most ridiculous. It's basically a thumbs up from the government saying, yes. we will allow you to connect to the sewer lines. Oh, sewer right? line. Oh, and wow. it's not I a, thought it's, it's just the impact for to the public, but wow. No, just... Well, it sort of, I guess, but just on the sewer side. And it uh it's it's not it's not permits for the sewer or anything like that. You also have to do that. It's not the construction of the plumbing or anything like that. You also have to do that. It's really literally just like a thumbs up saying, we'll allow you to do it. And for this 3000 square foot laundromat, which is, uh, you know, probably like an average size laundromat at this particular place, right. the impact fees and they charge per machine. No, uh, per machine. Imp- wow. Yeah. And the impact fees were going to be $390,000. No way. And so that's without, acquisition of machines that's without actually permits the plumbing the electric like all that stuff on top of it um and it just killed that deal so a lot of places it's and, and that that impact fee varies wildly uh, right. depending on location i don't want to scare everybody off of course um but uh yeah but a lot of places it's cost prohibitive to to build new laundromats and it's a lot of infrastructure um and you've got to find the right location so and it's a fairly mature market also. Right. Um, so there's, you know, aside from new communities being built or expanded out, there's really not a whole lot of places to build them uh, most of the time. So, so and another risk I'm seeing, again, I may be wrong. That's why I'm, I, I want to ask you is that most of the people are have washer and dryer at home. And this is the question a lot of people even ask me when I talk about long, why would they go out to, wash their clothes especially now even the apartments you can rent from the you know uh from uh you know private stores as well as from the apartment building right why would you go want to go out you know carry all these uh, clothes and and stand in a laundromat for a couple of hours <laughs> yeah well i don't i mean have, have you ever done laundry in the apartment building yes long time so, ago yes so i mean my my experience with that is you know number one they usually only have one maybe yes. two size machines yeah. uh and usually it's those top load machines which are the small ones they don't clean your clothes as well so that's part of it but then two all the time people will put their laundry in there they forget and they'll them. leave and then you come <laughs> back and the machines are full of somebody else's wet clothes and you're like do i take them out and if so right. am i going to get in a fight and <laughs> you know um and it takes all day long to do it because they have these small machines and, and all that right where a lot of people are just like i'll just take it to the laundromat they've got huge machines they've got a whole bunch of them i can just get it all done in an hour hour and a half and i'm out the door to do you know the rest of my business um for the day so that's that's one side of things and you know i think that even a lot of uh a lot of not I, the majority of people who have them at home are going to do their laundry at home um if they're going to do their own laundry uh but some people will just opt to go uh to the laundromat because they look at the pile of laundry and they're like if i do this in my washer and my dryer it's literally going to take me all day long Whereas I can just take it to the laundromat or they have bigger like comforter stuff like that. Right. The other side of it is the other side of the industry that's booming right now is going to continue to, I think for a while is the actual service side of the business. And so that's like drop off yes. laundry and pick up and delivery laundry, uh, which is, you know, fairly, fairly newish. And, you know, COVID gave us a little boost right uh, there where and that's what were, i was alluding to <laughs> yeah people are outsourcing their their laundry yeah. now which makes a ton of sense right this is laundry has got to be america's most hated chore that we have <laughs> left to do right and so i think just more and more people are going to be like you know what you take care of the laundry yeah. for me and you know i set it on my front porch it disappears it comes back clean folded ready for me to put away and yeah. uh 
that's it. Right. And it, to me, that's a no brainer. And I think a lot of people are going that way. No, that's, that's great. That makes sense. Let's talk about your worst deal. What has been your worst deal and, oh, and what did yeah. you learn from it? Oh my gosh. So that my first deal was my worst deal by far. Uh, so that was, uh, like I said, almost a decade ago. And, uh, I bought this laundromat from the broker and I ended up paying all cash for it. It was like 65 or $70,000, something like that. Um, and it's what we call in the business a zombie mat, which is basically a fixer upper laundromat. That's what a lot of people think of when they think of laundromat kind of <laughs> half the machines don't work. Half right. the lights don't work. Maybe there's a cockroach crawling across the floor, <laughs> you know? Um, and so we bought it for 65, 70, something like that. And then, uh, replaced uh, a big chunk of the equipment. And I want to say it was like 150,000 or so for, uh, for the equipment. I financed that hundred uh, percent. One of the perks of laundromats is that yeah. there, there's some good financing options specifically on uh, retooling and putting new equipment in the store. Yes. There's a lot of hundred percent financing options. Although right now, that's a little tricky because the interest rates interest are so rates, high yeah. and machine costs have gotten a lot more than they used to be. Um, but, uh, but that's what I did. And uh, I ended up losing a couple grand a month, every month for wow. a couple years. Uh, it was, it was rough and I couldn't figure out why, you know, there's a stat that floats yeah. around. That's like 95% of laundromats are successful. And I'm like, there is no yeah. way that I am in the 5% <laughs> that cannot figure this easy business out. Like there's just no way. Um, so yeah, so that was definitely my worst deal. And it, you know, it was, it was rough. Cause like I said, we were expecting to replace our income, you know, with this laundromat. And instead we were losing a couple grand. So do you still own it or did you sell it? I, I just sold it. And uh, did you make money when you sold or no? Uh, well, depends on what you mean by that. <laughs> like <laughs> if I went back and like, I mean, I literally lost six figures over, I see. over yeah, so I owned it's it not for what? eight years. <laughs> so I probably ended up losing money in the long run or eh, maybe it was close. I, I might've break broke even uh, in the long run. It was close, uh, but uh, learned a lot of very yes. expensive and valuable lessons uh, in the meantime. And uh yeah, but there was a lot of pain with that too, right? Like when you're when you make a big investment, that was a big investment for me at the time, right? And right. You make a big investment and it doesn't go well. Like that's that's tough. I think that's why so many people are scared to take that first step, right? Yes. It's like they're afraid of that happening to them. Yeah, it's a seminar, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, this was great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Um, let's move on to the fire round. All right. Let's do it. Would you be changing business or investment strategy because of the current environment, high interest rate and inflation not coming down? Um, yes, a little bit. I would say actually, I'm I'm uh, I'm I'm in the process of looking to expand the portfolio uh, right now of laundromats, um, and so, but it, you know, part of that is would be raising private capital, right? Instead of going the traditional lending right. route. So, I mean, I think that's a little bit of a shift in in my business plan in terms of the acquisition side of things. Uh, in terms of operations, I mean, other, you know, inflation's kind of hit a lot of small businesses hard. I mean, it's hit everybody hard, right? Um, but, you know, like utility costs have gone up dramatically. We're heavy on the utilities, uh, you know, there. And so having to do things like implement a strategic plan of how we're going to, you know, raise prices um, and do it where, you know, there's still a lot of like mom and pop laundromats out there and they're willing to run their laundromats on very, very slim margins. So they're not right. raising prices or they don't even know if they're making money or not. Right. And so yeah. uh, it could be tough to compete there. Right. So I think just being hyper-focused on, how do we make sure our customers have a great experience when they come? Uh, I think that is more important. It's always been important in any business. Although right. you look at laundromats, maybe we missed that memo uh, by and large, right. but it's more important now than ever, at least in our industry to really focus on that customer experience. 
Oh, that's great. Favorite nonfiction book that could be investment, business, yeah, self development. Yeah, and that's favorite book is a hard. I've got books stacked up all over me and back here <laughs> and all over the place. So I read a lot of nonfiction books, a lot of business books. I listen to a lot of books. Uh, I can share one that has really hit me recently. Uh, that is, it sort of helped me shift kind of my perspective and my business model and all that too, which is. Um, one of the books that uh, Benjamin Hardy and, and Dan Sullivan just put out, the 10X is just going easier to Dan, than Dan 2X. Dan <laughs> yeah. And so that one just, you know, and for me, like the, the big takeaway that just hit me from that book is like, if you're looking to grow incrementally, whatever you're doing, it doesn't have to be business, but anything, if you're looking to grow incrementally, there's like an infinite number of ways, paths that you can choose to grow incrementally, right? If you're looking to go 10X in any area of your life, you're going to go 10X it actually is easier because there's really only a handful or maybe right. even one, one way, way. <laughs> to go 10 X. Right. And that was just a big aha for me. And I was like, yeah, that's so true. Um, and you know, for a lot of us, when we are like struggling with what direction do I go or how do I, you know, get that $10,000 a month of cash flow so I can leave my job or whatever it is. Right. Um, there's a whole bunch of ways you can do that. Right. But if you start to think bigger, then the ways start to narrow down and the actions you have to take become clear because a lot of actions aren't going to get you to that 10 X. Right. So that was a good book for me. Got it. Any tool or website you recommend or you cannot live without. Uh, yeah, well, I mean, just in general, I mean, listen, for me, it's probably a tie between audible and, podcasting platform. I mean, that's where I get a lot of uh, just my information and knowledge uh, there. I mean, obviously, if you're interested in the laundromat space, laundromatresource.com would be the place to go. Right. Uh, but <laughs> and the tools we have over there, but just in general, I mean, you can, I, I tell my kids this all the time, right? When you, I, I used to tell them this when they were little, or I was like, when you learn to read, it's so cool because the entire world opens up to you and you, yeah. you know, you can learn things that you didn't even know were out there. And that happened to me when I was introduced to real estate investing and small businesses and laundromats. Right. And I started listening to podcasts and reading books about these things and a whole world opened up to me that I didn't even know existed. Uh, so audible and your podcasting platform. So any advice for investors? Oh yeah. So so one, one big piece of advice I would suggest right now, and you you've probably already got this covered because you're here on this podcast uh, right now, but one piece of advice I give is uh, be extra diligent on who you're giving your money to right now. Um, in the past, you know, before the world went crazy here with, uh, you know, all these prices going up and inflation and interest rates and all that stuff, uh, you could give your money to just about anybody, especially in real estate, and they could make you money. Right. Um, we're sort of entering into slash are already into a market where you want to be trusting your money with somebody who who knows what they're doing. Uh, it's not a anybody can make you money kind of market right now. There's a lot going on. And so, you know, do do your extra due diligence on who you're investing with. Uh, I agree. How do you give back? Um, I, lots of ways. I mean, I think part, partly, uh, you know, my podcast, uh, and you know, the YouTube and the website and all that stuff, that's, that's a huge way that I give back. Um, and you know, our, one of our big goals at laundromat resource is to help people achieve their financial freedom through laundromat ownership. Um, but, um, the vision is sort of expanded a little bit. And one, one cool thing about laundromats is they're one of the few places where laundromat or where communities still gather together, like in person. Um, and a lot of times these communities are sort of lower income communities. And so I think that we have a great opportunity as an industry, a la the laundromat industry, to actually transform communities. And one thing that I am, I, you know, I mourn is that our industry is not taken that seriously. And so the fact that there's so many laundromats, like when most people think of laundromats, they think of like a dump. 
Right. You know, if somebody runs their laundromat like that, they're essentially communicating to that community. Like you don't, you you don't have value. You don't have worth. You're not worth me investing in my business to give you something good. But on the contrary, we have the ability to go in, give people a nice, clean, comfortable, safe place to do laundry, to gather as a community uh, and to foster that community. And, and with, by doing that, we can communicate a message of, Hey, you met this community matters. There's value here. Uh, you're worth investing in uh, this community. I think that has uh, an ability to really transform community. So I'm trying to help people by, you know, my giving back is trying to help people achieve their financial freedom while also helping, you know, being, being a small piece of, of the pie of everybody helping their communities when they own their laundromats. So it's awesome. Yeah. How can my listeners reach out to you? Uh, yeah. So my email is Jordan, J O R D A N at laundromatresource.com and laundromatresource.com, or you can Google laundromat resource. We're on all the podcasting platforms, YouTube, all the social media stuff. You can find us any that anywhere there. So. Thank you so much, Jordan, for your time today. Man. Thanks for having me on. It's been a pleasure. Absolutely. Thanks for listening to the wealth matters podcast. If you enjoyed it, Please leave us a five-star rating on iTunes so others can enjoy the show too. Have a great week and happy investing!